And those listening now online, welcome to today's Friday night talk, live from Perth, Western Australia. Okie dokie. <coughs> okay. Most people are in, finding nice space. So as usual, I get many suggestions for talks uh, for Friday night. And there's so many suggestions, there's not enough time for the talks to deal with every suggestion. So today I'm just going to be um, ambitious and try to roll four suggestions into one talk. Totally different suggestions, that is. The first suggestion was from a nice letter from somebody over in the Philippines who's been listening to these talks and found them immensely helpful for their daughter who had some problems and they couldn't afford a psychologist or a psychiatrist. So they just get these talks online for free and they work. And because of that, they decided they want to become a Buddhist, and they went to their local Buddhist temples. But they found that it wasn't quite the same Buddhism as we teach here in uh, Perth. It was just more like praying and rituals. And so they asked me, they said, they heard there were five types of Buddhism. Can I explain what those five types are? And I thought, I don't know. So I decided to invent five types of Buddhism. <laughs> So this evening, you're going to hear my invention of the five types of Buddhism. But not really just five types of Buddhism, just five types of religion. I just want to extend this. So the first type of religion which I invented this evening was conceited religion. We are the best, the only way. And the second type of religion was like the ritualistic religion, where we spend so much of our time doing all of these ceremonies. And we don't really understand what the religion is really all about anyway. It's just ceremonies. And we do it because everyone else does it. It must be good because grandma did it. And grandma did it because her grandma did it. And a monk said something once which thought it was good, but it becomes ritualistic Buddhism. And the third type of Buddhism is, what was that going to be? Ritualistic, yeah, like dogmatic religion. Well, that's actually part of the first one. A ritualistic religion, business religion. I did think about this this earlier today. But, um, okay, let's call it business religion. Because business religion is where it's all about just, you know, seeing who's the most wealthy. And the last, the fourth one is like negative religion. And there's a lot of negative religion where by making people afraid, by uh, getting on negativity that you can actually get people really roused up, always finding faults in the other religion next to you. And of course the last one is the, the real religion, which hasn't got any of those other sort of negative qualities behind it. And as part of these four types of religion, I'm also going to be, uh, see if I can cover in just you know, how to deal with disabilities and how just to be happy with no matter what you've got. In other words, not being judgmental. And also somebody asked me about, can you speak something about organ donation? And lastly, about how to deal with addictions. So these are all going to be, be rolled somehow or other into one talk. So that's my challenge. So here we go. But the first part, like conceited religion. Uh, somebody sent me a link on an email to a program which was very interesting uh, on the ABC last week, the Q&A between Richard Dawkins and Cardinal Pell. Cardinal, and it's a, well, it's a great entertainment. I really loved it. It's, we don't get much entertainment as monks, but because I was religious, you know, we managed to go and see it. And Cardinal Pell is the leader of the Catholic Church in Sydney, and Richard Dawkins, many will know, He's supposed to be the militant atheist, but he doesn't carry a gun. I don't know why they call him uh, militant. And even sometimes they call him evangelical atheist. And then I walked in the, in the uh, dictionary. Does that really work? Is he really evangelist? And actually, evangelical means someone who bears good news. 
So I'm an evangelist. I am, because I bear good news about how to be happy and how to be peaceful and I even bear good jokes now, every now and again. Not that often, but sometimes. So, yes, yeah, okay. But the thing which, looking at that program, the thing which I noticed, and I think many of you may have noticed, it was good entertainment, but there's so much conceit on both sides. Basically, a lack of really listening to the other point of view. The assumption that I am right. You may be right, but... Just there was a lack of that interest in what the other person was thinking and why they thought that way. Now, as a Buddhist monk who's been a Buddhist monk a long time, who not only just hangs out with his own friends, but hangs out with people from other forms of Buddhism and also hangs out sometimes with you know, abbots of Catholic monasteries and archbishops and other leaders of religion and rabbis. So actually, to, one of the great things I love doing now is actually, yeah, put aside what I believe in or what I know is true and see if you can get in the head, the mind of the other person. Not just by saying, you're wrong, I'm much better than you are. That's conceit. But try to think, why do you think that way? Why do you have that set of beliefs? Why do you do what you do? And what that actually does for me, instead of actually coming across as this conceit who already knows what's true, it means that you open your mind up to seeing something else. Maybe challenging you know, your own views and beliefs, but also what usually happens is actually broadening your beliefs. Not necessarily changing them and thinking you're wrong, but getting a bigger picture by you know, standing in the, sho- in, the, in the sandals of another person. And not the shoes, because monks, you know, religious people, we don't wear sort of shoes, we wear sandals or whatever. Anyway, I think you know what I mean. So by doing such things, you can get a much, much better understanding of where people are coming from. So it would have been great if Cardinal Pell would put aside his Catholic dogma for a while. Then why does a good scientist like Richard Dawkins think the way he does? Where is he coming from? And the same with, with you know, Richard Dawkins. You know, he's a scientist. A scientist should not be someone who just you know, says that he knows what's true, but always is gathering more information trying to gather more data to find a bigger picture of things. And this is one of the things which really turned me off against religion when I was young. Everybody was saying, we've got the message, we're right, everyone else is wrong, so just believe in in what, what I do. And sometimes when I come across that in Buddhism, I just really tear my hair out. That's why I'm always bored, because it happens very often. And you do see that in Buddhism sometimes. Some sort of sects or some groups say, we are the real Buddhism. Our Buddhism was not revealed when the Buddha was alive. It was kept hidden in the dragon world because people weren't intelligent enough to really understand because we've got the teachings for the intelligent ones. Or... We've got the teachings which were revealed in secret in this wonderful sutra which was discovered much later on. Or we have got the original teachings of the Buddha. So this is why that we are superior. And you can see that many people actually state that. Or our teacher was enlightened. And so that we have the true teachings from the enlightened teachers. That's conceit, saying that we've got the truth and no one else has. And it does create cults. I really mean cults within Buddhism, which means that you only go to one temple, you never go to another temple. You never go to that dirty old temple down the road. All they do is just pray to the Buddha. You never go to that Nolamara temple. They just listen to jokes every Friday evening. It's not real Buddhism. You've got to be serious. Now, whatever it is, that is like it's a conceited Buddhism. And that, as far as I understand, that's got nothing to do with the real teachings. Everybody who comes here, you certainly have my permission and all the other monks and nuns' permission to go to any other temple or church or mosque or any other place. If there's a good talk being given there, go and listen. Because the wider the teachings, I say, the better. Just like at university. Yeah, I was studying physics, but there was many lecturers teaching. And actually, I was told, it's one of the great 
memories I have of Cambridge in those years. I was told when I first went up there by the senior tutor, he said, look, this is a great university. I know you're studying one subject, but there are lecturers and professors here who are experts in their field. Make use of the resources in this great university. Don't just go and study physics. Go to a philosophy lecture, if that's what you're interested in. Go to a lecture in ancient Greek, even though you don't know a word of Greek, because there are some great philosophers and, and teachers here who will inspire you. Don't just stick to your particular subject. Go wide. Make use of the great resources which are here. And I think that is going against conceit to a way of understanding and knowledge and investigation which never says, I have it all, I know, and everyone else is stupid. Because such a thing has got nothing to do with religion. And if you start thinking like that, you know the results. That's where we have arguments. From conceit we get arguments, and from arguments we get violence and war. Only because we think that we know more than other people. And so how do we stop that conceit? It's just opening the door of our heart. Opening our ears and listening to the other. And never thinking they're wrong. Instead of thinking, why do they think like that? Where are they coming from? That they have that different view. And when you can do that, you can get a much, much greater understanding. The, the classic example of this is something which I said in a talk about atheism and Buddhism some time ago. It was a question which I was asked by uh, the great sort of uh, Frank Brennan. You know, he's, uh, uh, he was the person who was charged by our government in Australia of trying to introduce a human rights um, uh, legislation into a constitution, Father Frank Brennan. I was doing a, a conference here in Perth in UWA some time ago. He was in the audience and I was presenting with Abbot Placid from the Benedictine Monastery. And Father Frank Brennan, you know, he's a very sharp fellow, and he sort of asked me, he said, you're a Buddhist, I've been listening to you, obviously just, you know, not just a normal Buddhist who just spouts everything which I've heard before. What is a Buddhist idea of God? Now, most people would say that Buddhism doesn't believe in a creator God. Yeah, you can read that in books. But let's take it deeper. That would be conceited. And that's what sort of someone like Richard Dawkins was doing. Let's take it deeper to get a better understanding of the question. And so what I did, I said to Father Frank Ben, this is my friend, Abbot Placid, next to me. He was a good friend. And I said, he's often told me, you know, in private, that he has a fundamental belief that everybody is searching for God. Now that's what he said. So I sort of respect that fellow, and this is what is a lack of conceit. Respect what the other person's saying, that's how they believe. Why do they think that? What's going on that they make that statement? So instead of negating it, you try and understand it. So you have to respect before you understand. So respecting his position, I tried to understand it, and I said, well, look, I respect what he says. What he's seen there is something which was true to him, and it's probably true throughout the whole world. So as a Buddhist, what do Buddhists seek? What are they seeking for? You know, from that sort of premise, I soon worked out that what Buddhists seek for is truth, understanding, respect, love, peace, happiness. Isn't that what you're seeking by coming here? And if that's what Buddhists are seeking, and this fellow next to me, my good friend, I respect and love very much, he said that everyone's seeking for God. And this is what we're seeking for, then that must be what God is. Peace, love, kindness, what you're seeking for. And then, you know, Abbot Placid smiled, he said, yeah, I agree with that. And I agreed with it. So we had harmony with our God belief. Wasn't that wonderful? Now that's an example of what happens when you don't argue with each other, which is conceit. You try and understand each other. That is what religion is supposed to be doing. Not creating more barriers between people, but harmonizing between people. So wouldn't it be wonderful if you could sit you know, with the leader of the Taliban and not say you're a terrorist, you're a bad guy or a bad woman, 
but to say, why? Where are you coming from? What is your belief? Why do you believe that way? And I think it would be amazing that if we put aside our conceit and our judgment and try to understand where they're coming from and for them to reciprocate by trying to understand where we're coming from, maybe there can be some greater understanding because the biggest problem is the conceit that I've got the truth and you haven't, that I am right and you are wrong. Whenever there was an argument in the monasteries in Thailand when Ajahn Chah was around, he'd always talk to the two people who were arguing. And he said to the first person, he said this very often, he said, you are right, but not correct. You are correct, but not right. I thought that was a (laughs) wonderful way of dealing with the argument. Because it's true that everyone has got a portion which is right, but not correct. Everyone is correct but not right. That means we never actually understand each other. So conceited religion has nothing to do with what real religion is all about. Our religion of Buddhism is to try and come and see, investigate, find out for yourself. So the way to find out is through that investigation, both being aware, being humble, being kind, and listening rather than thinking too much. We were just uh, this afternoon, we did a marriage ceremony here, and uh, Dennis, a former president, was saying his usual talk. You know, I say, I repeat myself, he repeats himself many times as well, as we all do when we get our ceremony and our, our patter just right down. And he was always saying about the mystery. And the mystery, again, in a marriage, is realizing you will never know the person you're living with. You will never know them. If you think you know them, you've lost the idea of what a relationship is all about. It's always discovering new things about the other person. Just as the same way you're always going to be discovering new things about yourself. Do you really know who you are? And you've been living with yourself much longer than your partner. So, of course, we always discover new things about ourselves. That's the unfolding of this great investigation. And you will always be discovering new things about the truth of something like Buddhism or about religion. Never think that you know everything. If you do, you are one of those people who follow conceited religion, the sort of religion which creates arguments and wars and divisions between people. And if you don't have that conceited religion, then you have an opportunity where people of many different religions can be real good friends and can walk a path together, even though they're coming from different places. We can feed off each other and know much more. But a lot of that conceit comes from, I am superior, you are inferior. And that's one of the places I can introduce now disabilities. Because sometimes people think, oh, you poor person, Ajahn Brahm, you know, you went into the Hinayana, the lower vehicle, you're disabled by your path. You should join the higher vehicle. Or even that you follow Buddhism, you should have followed the great teachings of whoever it is. Sometimes people actually think that we're mentally disabled as monks. It was true, you know, this is a true story, I love telling this story. See the monk sitting next to me? He's very quiet. That's what the, the attendant monk is supposed to do. He's supposed to be quiet and let me do all the speaking. Just like when I was here as a second monk with the former abbot, Ajahn Chakra, and somebody was telling me there's lots of his talks in the library. You should actually listen to them. They're very good talks. And when I was his attendant, I would sit next to him being perfectly quiet. He would give all the talks, he would answer all the questions. But after being here in Perth for six months or nine months, Ajahn Chakra went back to Thailand for a visit. So, of course, then I had to give the Friday night talk and answer all the questions. And after I'd given the first talk, this young 13 or 14-year-old girl came up and said, that's amazing, you can talk. (laughs) I thought you were mentally disabled. That's what she said to me. You know what 13, 14 year old girls are like? Just because I was silent didn't mean I was disabled. (laughs) 
It's just because it was rare, that's all. And it's amazing just how people just can criticize you for such things. Just because you didn't talk, it didn't mean you were inferior at all. Just because a person sometimes suffers episodes of schizophrenia, it doesn't mean they're inferior at all. If they are sight challenged, if they are only got one leg, or whatever else you've got, you know, which is not the same as anybody else, does that really make you inferior? Sometimes we have the stigmatism of mental illness and physical disabilities, which is again part of conceited religion, in the sense of being conceited, thinking, I am so superior because I don't have what you've got. And of course, I think you've all known that what happens is not just what you've got or what you're missing, but how you make use of that. That is the most important part of life. It's a standard description of the law of karma. Many people think the law of karma only means a way of retribution, of settling scores. Ha ha ha, you really hurt me, karma's going to get you. That is not the main me meaning of the law of karma. The law of karma means whatever you've got in life, that's the ingredients you have. The law of karma means how are you using those ingredients? The standard description is the two people making a cake. One has got the very worst ingredients you could possibly imagine to bake their cake. They've got white flour, diabetically enriched sugar. They have cholesterol enriched oil or butter. And they've got fruit which is so hard that the American army want to use it as bullets. <laughs> the very worst ingredients you can imagine. And the second person has got the best ingredients you can imagine. They've got organically grown whole wheat flour without any GM crops within a thousand miles. And they've got beautiful um, no, canola oil, which apparently is um, uh, cholesterol-free. And instead of sugar, they've got wonderful honey, pure honey, from next door to Bodhinyana Monastery. It's even, it's even holy honey, enriched by all these amazing Buddhist bees. And <laughs> lastly, what else? They've got fruit. They've got fresh fruit from the orchards around Perth. Actually, no, you, can't, yeah, you two come from Adelaide. They've got the best fruit from Adelaide, <laughs> <laughs> for our guests. So, which person bakes the most delicious cake? It's not always the person with the best ingredients, because the ingredients are only part of baking the cake. It's what you do with those ingredients is perhaps the most important of all. And sometimes people with the worst ingredients make the most delicious food. How many of you have been to Asia and go to the hawker stalls? You get the best food from the hawker stalls than you do in the five-star restaurants. Why? In the five-star restaurants, they've got the very best ingredients and amazing kitchens to cook the food. But in the hawker stores by the street, they have such strong competition. If they don't sell the food, they really suffer. They can't feed their families. So the amount of effort and energy and care they put into their cooking is much greater than the chefs in the five-star restaurants who are going to get paid anyway. That is one of the reasons why even the hawkers with the worst ingredients make the best food because of what they do with what they've got. And that, to me, was the answer. That's what karma is. What you've got to deal with, your so-called disability, doesn't disable you. Whether you've got schizophrenia, whether you've got depression, whether you've got an addiction to gambling, whatever it is, it's what you're doing about it. 
That is the karma you are making. And if you understand this, this uh, idea of karma, you're not stigmatized at all. What it teaches you, you say, right, whatever you're dealt with in life, you can make the best cake of all, no matter what you have to deal with. And I know that is true. You know, in my situation as a leading monk, I meet some incredible people in this world, people who just inspire me. And these are not the people who have had an easy time in life. These are people who have really had it difficult, really had some terrible things happen to them in life. But my goodness, the way they've made use of that pain, of that tragedy, is just so uplifting. They've had some of the worst ingredients imaginable and they've made such an incredibly delicious cake. And that's taught me there is no such thing as a disability. All there is, is the opportunity to use whatever you've got and bake a much better cake than those people who become lazy because you know, they think they're okay. So whatever it is you have, it's only a disability if you don't understand the law of karma. Make something out of it. Grow. Use it. And it's amazing what you can do even with the very worst ingredients. Conceit is when you think, oh, I'm, I'm hopeless, you know, I'm terrible, I'm disabled, I've got schizophrenia, I've only got one leg, it's like I can't do anything. That is the problem. It's the disabled mind thinking that these things are hindering you in some way. Yeah, it's more difficult, but more difficult means more of a challenge. You go for it and make it happen. That's conceited Buddhism. The other type of Buddhism, this ritualistic Buddhism which we have. Always doing things in the same way because that's the way it's always been done. Okay, it may have worked before, but things always change. The world has to evolve. The world does evolve. Even truth, here we go, evolves. At least its expression evolves. And sometimes I see some of these religions, or even sometimes Buddhism, they just spend all the time doing rituals. You know, we had these amazing books, you know, which, you know, the teachings of the Buddha, the Tripitaka. And when I was a young monk, they were kept locked in the cabinets. We'd worship them, but never read them. <laughs> and that was ridiculous. Now, can't we read what the Buddha said? No, 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 just believe what the teacher said about what the Buddha said, instead of having a look for yourself. That was some of the rituals which, you know, which we got into. Even today, I went to Medan recently to give some talks. That was where I sort of, you know, I, my tickets to my, my gig, my talk, the outsold Lady Gaga. Her tickets <laughs> took two days to sell. My tickets went in eight hours. <laughs> and you know, I'm very proud of that. Okay, it is conceited, but, you know, give me a little bit of a break. I don't get much chance to brag as a Buddhist monk. But, you know, outsetting Lady Gaga, that was actually, you know, I, I, I quite like that. <laughs> but anyway, they took me to this big temple, Buddhist temple, over there. I'd never seen anywhere in the world something such, so big as this. And it was, it was dedicated to the coming Buddha, Maitreya, because they thought, well, it's a waste of time. No one can actually understand Buddhism these days, so we might as well build this, build this big temple so we can actually bribe our way to being reborn when the next Buddha came. And to me, that was absolutely ridiculous. Pure ritual, never really understanding what's, what's going on in Buddhism. These teachings are there, they work. They're amazing teachings which can solve incredible amount of problems in one's life and create a better harmonious world. Why don't we listen to what these teachings are saying and practice them instead of just worshipping them by, from afar by building big temples? having big uh, stupas. So I said last week, it, it comes on from, from the talk I gave last week about superstition. You know, why spend so much money building a huge temple with a big brass statue or a big stupa with the bones of the Buddha when we're not looking after our sangha? People who want to become monks or nuns but can't because there's no place for them. We don't actually spend time or money just making these teachings more available on the internet or somewhere. 
It's why can't we actually do something more wonderful? Really worship the teachings rather than the rituals. The story behind that was a difference between the container and the contents. Container and content simile was, you know, that story about, again, the Guantanamo Bay flushing the copy of the Koran down the toilet. Or just recently, apparently, there's a photograph of US soldiers over the remains of suicide bombers. Yeah, I mean, that's not a nice thing to do. But it's much worse to go and kill out of revenge. I mean, that's much, much worse. But the thing is that sometimes we think, this is desecrating our religion. This is blowing up Buddha statues. This is putting books down the toilet. You know that story when I, that happened, a journalist called here. I answered the phone. They wanted to speak to me. Ajahn Brahm, you're a Buddhist leader who could speak English in Australia. Can you please answer this question? I've been asking this of all the religious leaders in Australia. Now I've come to you. What would you do if somebody took a Buddhist holy book and flushed it down your toilet? What would be your reaction as a Buddhist leader? What would you do as a Buddhist? You know my answer, you've heard it before, many of you. I said, look, if somebody took a Buddhist holy book and flushed it down my toilet, the first thing I would do would be call a plumber. <laughs> I would need to use that toilet. We are very practical, we Buddhists. <laughs> and I said to them afterwards, I said, seriously, you can flush as many Buddhist books as you like down the toilet. You can blow up Buddha statues. You can burn down temples. You can even kill Buddhist monks and nuns. But I will never, ever allow you to destroy Buddhism. I will never allow you to destroy our peace, our forgiveness, our kindness. I'll never allow you to destroy our non-violence. That I will never allow you to flush down the toilet. And I made the distinction, the powerful distinction between the container and the contents, the statues, the books, they're containers. What's the contents? The rituals, they are the containers. And we have so many rituals these days, we don't even know what the contents are. You know, we have the books, we have the, the holidays, we have the rituals, but does anyone ever said, what are we doing that for? What is the contents of this? Last week I told you about some of the rituals we have in this temple and why we do them. When you understand the why, it makes sense. You understand the contents. Why we meditate. Meditation is not a ritual. Why we chant if we chant. You know, some places they chant so much they just get sore throat. They never get anything out of it. They never think, oh, if I chant a lot, then I'm going to go to heaven afterwards. Not the way you chant. They would never allow you in, you, in there with your bad voice. <laughs> but it's not through the chant. It's the, what are you chanting? That's one of the reasons. You know, I learned Pali. So when I chant, I know what these words mean. And my goodness, they're inspiring. When I chant them, they inspire me. I, it's like listening to teachings. So for me, it really works. For you guys, you, know, you want to know what you're chanting. And it's true. I must admit that sometimes I'm tired. I make mistakes. Sometimes I've done this. Please forgive me. But at a, a wedding ceremony, by mistake, I did the funeral chanting. <laughs> it must have been something, you know, amongst sort of uh, Freudian slip. Because the people didn't know, because it was in Pali. They hadn't got a clue what I was talking. They just said, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> it was a funeral chance. <laughs> and the couple survived. <laughs> so you can see this is ritual. But some people say, oh, that's bad luck. That's bad luck, Ajahn. But it's not bad luck. It's just what you make of it. You make your luck, like, you know, with the disability thing. So some of the ritual, if we don't understand it, that is a sort of Buddhism which, again, destroys this beautiful message inside. The ritual is there for a purpose. If you don't understand what that purpose is, don't do the ritual. Don't just do, oh, other people have done it, it must be right. No, find out why. Don't worship the containers, the contents, for goodness sake. And if other religions did the same, and all of Buddhism did the same, 
And we may not have as many big temples. We may not have as many gold Buddha statues. We may not have as many Bodhi trees with big gold railings around them. We may not have as many stupas, but have many more Buddhists. Good people, kind people, who actually practice what the Buddha wanted and have much happier and healthier lives. And that's the main reason why we have these teachings. Not so we can be, build big monuments, but so we can build people and have happy, harmonious, healthy human beings. That is a monument which we want to build. That's a temple. Even a church. A church is not the building. It's the people who come inside. A temple is not sort of the big statues or the big halls. The temple is the people who come there. Even when we first had Bodhinyana Monastery, all we had was a shearer's shed. That was our first place where we did our chanting and meditation. Ajahn Jaka would sleep there, I'd sleep on my door. <laughs> you all know that story, if you don't, I'll tell you another time. But people would come and say, where's the monastery, where's the monastery? What do you mean? This is the monastery. It's already here. It's the people, it's the monks, the people who are here. That's the monastery. People, please, not things. The contents, not the containers. And then we won't have a ritualistic Buddhism. Also, we won't have a sort of this business Buddhism or business religion. Business religion is not just getting assets, it's getting people. I've got more followers than you have. Na, 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 na. <laughs> Because that is like where, instead of, <laughs> I like going, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> instead of like, you know, just uh, seeing how wealthy you are, because that's, you know, what we call you know, materialism in this world. There's something called spiritual materialism. How many followers have you got? How big is your temple? How many branch monasteries have you have? That's in Thailand. And that's a sort of materialism, which is called like business religion. Seeing how many people you can get into your church, how big your, your church is, how magnificent it is. And you know, there's something really wrong with that, you know, with these great cathedrals and great buildings. And you think, gee, how much does that cost? Can't that money be used for better purposes? And it's a good point. Yes, it can. And, you know, our Buddhist society here, you know, with the leadership of the monks and the nuns, we do keep it simple. There's no ornaments in these places. There's no elaborate sort of gilded uh, uh, chandeliers. And I hope there never will be, because this is actually teaching something really important. This is not a business about uh, getting wealth or getting people. It's about getting hearts, creating more peaceful, beautiful people. That's what we're in about. So if a Buddhism is a business Buddhism, there's something really wrong with it. And that's also why we never charge entry fee in this place. There is an exit fee. To get out of the door, you have to pay. We don't charge. <laughs> that's what I was just suggesting. No entrance fee, but exit fees. So if you really don't like the talk, so you know, the, the earlier you want to leave, the more you have to pay. And if you stay for the whole talk, you can get out for free. Would that be a good idea? I've got these great business ideas, which never... Well, we were talking the other day about, actually just this morning, having a drive through temple. It'd be very easy, you know, you just drive through because you're very busy people, haven't got time to come all the time to the temple, so just drive in. And at the window, you can actually ask whether you want uh, uh, blessing chanting or meditation instruction. You can actually tell which particular type of meditation you do, and then whether you want holy water or whether you want sort of a blessing for marriage or uh, counseling for, for sickness or depression. You press the button, then you go to the next window, and then they give you the earphone and gives you that counseling for depression. Thank you very much. And then you actually you pay at the end. Would that be very good? Do you think a drive-in Buddhist temple? <laughs> that would be business Buddhism, wouldn't it? Just to try and get you sort of... And I've seen things pretty much like that. I've seen the monk with the holy water. One person comes in, sprinkles them, and they get these ang pao, these red packets. I saw this in Singapore. Next, please. Sprinkle. Another ang pao. Next, please. They're making a fortune. That was a business Buddhism. That's nothing to do with real Buddhism. And it sort of detracts you know, from what really religion should really be about. We should be teaching something other than consumerism, materialism. Isn't there something more important in the world than your bank balance? Where are people actually teaching that and living that? And you can actually see here, 
I don't have bank balance. I don't have credit card. I don't have any money in the bank whatsoever. I love this because sometimes people, uh, when you have to, what was it? I was, one of the things I do have, I have a health care card. Low income, actually no income. And every now and again, they ask me for proof of who I am. You know when you have to sort of get these so many points to see who you are? So you go to these places and they said, oh, you know, can you see your, your bank account? I've got no bank account, no credit card. Oh, OK. Can I see your marriage license? And I'm not married. <laughs> Driver's license, I haven't got one of them either. And all these things which identify you in this world, because it's all your material stuff, I haven't got. I haven't got anything. So it's very difficult proving who I am. In fact, once I was, I was challenged, I was in Melbourne Airport flying off somewhere, and they wanted proof of who I was, and I didn't have anything, except I did have a couple of copies of my book. I said, here you go, look, it says Ajahn Brahm, it's me on the cover. <laughs> and you know, they accepted that at the airport as you know, identity. So I was, actually, I was very lucky, otherwise I'd been stuck in them. Anyway, back to where was I? I was business Buddhism, yeah. Now, business religion. Religion should have nothing to do with business. And the next thing was like negative religion. On That's actually where you put everybody else down. It's fault finding. And you better be careful because sometimes it's easy to do that. As a Buddhist, find fault with the Christians. How can anyone believe you know, in that silly story of Jesus you know, being crucified? Or in Islam. How can anyone believe that no, you blow yourself up, just bad, and you go to heaven? How can anybody sort of believe in this sort of rubbish? How can anyone believe in Ajahn Brahm? It's absolutely rubbish. You know, it's so easy to find fault with other people, and find fault with religion, to find fault with government. It's a national pastime to find fault. You know, with the leaders of our country, to find fault with the police, you end up finding fault with the person you live with. And finally, you end up finding fault with yourself. That negativity which sometimes religions get into, which politicians are just so good at, that is a very bad cancer which sometimes religion should not get involved in at all. Instead of fault finding and seeing all the things wrong, in the religion which you don't like, seeing all the things wrong in the part of Buddhism you don't like, and criticizing the other parts of Buddhism. Instead, religion should show the other way of respect and gratitude. Thank you, partner, for being who you are. You're not the most perfect wife. You're certainly not the most perfect husband. You're good enough. I respect your wonderful qualities, which are there. At the wedding today, I told the two people getting married, remember today why you decided to love each other and become married. Why? Why did you do that? Why? Remember that for the rest of your life. So when you see all the wrong things in each other, remember that there's the good things in each other as well. Or the story I told them that when... This was a disciple in Singapore. She told me that when she got married, her father took his new son-in-law aside. He wanted to give his new son-in-law some advice. He said, you probably love my daughter very much. He said, she's a wonderful girl. I'm just so lucky to marry her. Everything she does is charming. Even the way she picks her nose is just so lovable. <laughs> And he said, that's what it's like when you first fall in love. Everything your partner does is beautiful and lovely. But he said, usually after two or three years, maybe longer, maybe shorter, you'll start to see the faults and defects in my daughter. You start to be critical of her and fault-finding. But please remember this, son-in-law. If my daughter didn't have those faults to begin with, she'd have married someone much better than you. <laughs> So please remember that. <laughs> when you start to see the faults in your wife, she never had those faults. She'd have got some, a boy much better than you. So be, <laughs> and it works the other way around too. So be grateful. You're not perfect either. So that way, instead of finding fault, we can just be so grateful there's a person willing to share their life with us. There's a person I respected once, and those qualities are still in there again. So instead of being fault-finding and seeing all the things wrong, 
we see all the things which are right. It's a hard thing to do. You know you get much more energy finding fault. Which is why in political campaigns, people make much more mileage seeing faults in the other side rather than respecting the good things they've done. That party is bad, they're evil, they're corrupt, they ruined the economy, they've done this. Doesn't that get you up, you know, really passionate? But imagine if, like, Julia Gillard said, Tony Abbott's such a wonderful fellow. <laughs> you know, his heart is in the right place, he really loves Australia, and he's trying his best to do something. <laughs> Wouldn't that be just refreshing? <laughs> Especially if she really meant it. <laughs> Why can't we respect each other? And that's really important to actually with, between religions, because religion should be something which shows a way, which is not just doing what other people do, but has a higher level of you know, morality, a higher level of virtue, which sees a bigger picture, a more beautiful picture, a more hopeful picture, which sees a good in each other. So the Jews see the beauty in Islam. The Muslims see the beauty in Buddhists. Buddhists see just the wonderful qualities in Christianity. And praise each other instead of negativity. Sort of a way of respect. And seeing the kind things in others. Similarly, which I give here the story. I once, uh, first time I went to Christ Church Grammar School here in Perth to give a, a talk at the morning assembly. First time I went there, I knew sort of uh, Frank Sheehan, the, the, uh, the uh, priest there, for a long time. So he, you know, got me in, he got me the gig. And as I went there in the morning, so the principal was on the outside, said all of the kids were inside, waiting for, you know, the morning assembly to begin. I was going to give the speech. And he said, he said, you know, you're a Buddhist, this is a Christian school. When we go in, there's a little shrine to Jesus, and we're going to bow to that shrine. You know, Frank Sheehan and me, the, the headmaster, said, you're a Buddhist, you know, you don't need to, to bow. And I decided to make a good point. I said, what do you mean, I can't bow? I demand my right to bow to your shrine. <laughs> I was very patient. You got really so quiet. What do you mean? You're a Buddhist. And I said, look, I can find something in that shrine which I can respect. And that's what I'm going to bow to. So the three of us went in there, and we all bowed to the, the Christian shrine. Now that's what I mean about a path not of negativity, but a path of seeing something in the difference which you really respect. And if a Buddhist can bow to a Christian shrine, maybe the Muslims will bow to a Jewish shrine. Maybe that you can bow to your ex. <laughs> and we'll have a stopping this stupidity of anger and ill will <laughs> in our world. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? And it can be done. That's what religion is supposed to teach, how it can be done. Now at the same time of talking about all of this, I didn't really get around to, I did a little bit about addictions. Addictions when you, is when you see the negative side of life and the negative side of yourself. You, a lot of time addiction comes from lack of self-esteem, you know, the, old, the old story. I don't deserve to get better. I don't deserve to have a happy life. And you know, this is incredibly powerful, just that sense of guilt and negativity towards oneself. It's actually so strong. Even to some people who won't get into deep meditation, they won't become enlightened because they think they don't deserve it. That's all. That's the only barrier. Somehow inside of you, you think, you know, you're not good enough. Again, that comes from that negativity I just was talking about. How many of you have been respected? And how many of you, people have pointed out your faults? You're not good enough. You said this wrong, you exaggerated, you're you know, a liar, you told, you're not a liar, maybe you told one lie, but you're not a liar. But people point that out, and they point that out to you, get so much criticism in the workforce, sometimes from your partner, which is disgusting. Please, if you're married together, if that's someone you're living with, please praise them, respect them for goodness sake. Don't point out their faults, that's not your job. If you want to point out your faults, you're on the road to divorce. Point out the good qualities in each other. It's amazing, when you start hearing, I'm respected, people like me, 
this person sees the good qualities in me. Maybe there are some good qualities in there after all. Your self-esteem goes up. You realize you are worthwhile after all. And the fundamental reason why people get into the addictions of drugs or alcohol or gambling disappear. I've seen that happen with prisoners. You know, I've worked a lot with prisoners. Give them their self-esteem back. They're not a rapist. They're a person who's done a rape. They're much bigger than that terrible thing they did. Hugely bigger. It's a tough thing for them to see. But when they see that, the esteem goes up, which means when they get released from jail, they don't need to go back again. They don't go back. They're free. I don't believe in punishment. I believe in rehabilitation. Making sure it never happens again. The past is gone. The punishment actually creates more pain. Moving forward, rehabilitation. Now the old story, karma, you've got bad ingredients there, you can make something beautiful of it. I'm here to inspire you, to help you. That's my job. It's amazing what you can do. And lastly, with organ donation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an organ donor myself. The trouble is, it's supposed to be with the rituals. Because sometimes that people have this ritualistic, this written in one sort of book, be careful, my goodness, if you disturb the body just when it's dying, you're going to stop them getting a beautiful rebirth. Oh my goodness, if you give your organs, that mits it, you can't go to heaven anymore. Now look, the most important thing is your state of mind. And I'm, I'm an organ donor because I know that when I'm dying, if somebody wants my organs, that would make me so happy. Have you actually seen a person who's received like a kidney transplant? Which means they no longer have to go on dialysis. I've visited many dialysis centers. The sort of people who have to lie there for hours, so many, three days a week for the rest of their life. In such difficulty, such discomfort. And just one kidney can stop that and give people a life. Sometimes a little kid or a young mother of kids. What a wonderful gift that is. To give an organ to someone who really needs it. To me, if that happened to me, when I died, when I knew that someone was taking out my heart or my liver or whatever else I've got inside which is usable, what a wonderful gift that would be. That would make me so happy. It's dana, it's generosity. You don't need it anymore. Other people do. Well, that will give you so much happiness to any discomfort or pain. That will be nothing compared to the mental uplift you give, you get, of actually doing something wonderful to save the life of another human being. That's wonderful good karma, which means that you'll get into a much higher rebirth, much more than if you're worried about, oh, it's going to hurt, oh, I'm not sure what's going to happen to me, oh... If you lose your common sense, rather than follow the rituals, it's obvious it's a wonderfully good thing to do. So please, don't follow the books. That's the containers. Follow the contents. All those books, as I kept on saying, where is the Buddhist suttas written? What teachings do we follow? What books do we really revere in here, in the heart? That's where the Buddhist teachings are. That's where religious teachings are. So that's where it is. Follow your heart. It feels the right thing to do. If it feels the right thing to do, it usually is. So be an organ donor. It's a wonderful thing to do. And I guarantee, I guarantee you that if you give your organs when you die, you will never, ever regret it. <laughs> So go for it. Give the whole lot. I can mold my organs. You can use the whole lot. You can use my brain. And if you get my brain, you'll come out telling bad jokes afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want, it's yours. It's not mine anyway. You've, you've been feeding this body for the last 38 years. So I don't own this body anyway. It belongs to the Buddhist Society of West Australia. <laughs> you can use it for whatever you want. So those are the five types of religion.
as I intended it. Number one, conceited religion. We're better than you are, which means we never listen to each other, we argue. The other next one was ritualistic uh, religion, where we follow the containers, not the contents. And the third one was business Buddhism, where we just worry about how many converts we can get and how big our temples are and how rich we are. And the fourth one was negative Buddhism or negative religion, where we would tend to put down each other rather than respect each other. You know, it's too easy to find fault with other people or other religions. And religion, we should follow a different path and respect one another and see the good in other things. Let other people find the faults. We're going to find the good. And the lastly, about, which is the opposite of all that, real Buddhism or real religion, which is the opposite of the other four. That's number five. I think I just made it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the talk this evening. Okay. Now we've got three questions here from overseas, from Indonesia, from Florida, and Scotland. That's actually just a nice... Um, wide area. First question, does or can meditation heal, cure disease? Of course it can heal disease. The mental disease is the first thing which it heals. But when the mind is very peaceful and calm, yeah, it's amazing just how many diseases can be healed. Look, one very clear case uh, when uh, some years ago, teaching a retreat, this is when we had our North Perth, we had to get the North Perth Centre to our retreats. It was a Catholic centre. This fellow came uh, at to the retreat, he had this psoriasis, this rash all over his body. I'd never seen anything so bad. The whole body was covered. And he had this rubber mask over his face to stop him scratching. And he was, he'd been to the doctors, he'd been to this and been to that. He was coming to meditation as one of the last throws of the dice, just in case it might work. And he came to see me because he said, look, I don't know if I can even last today, you know, let alone nine days. So if I leave, please forgive me, because look at me. And when I looked, I had so much compassion, because this guy was in torture. Now, even in some of these places where people are being tortured by the military dictatorships, at least they know they don't do it 24 hours a day. This guy, 24 hours a day, you can see this whole rash all over his body. No part of it didn't have the rash. And I felt so much compassion for this guy. So he managed to last for nine days. I was really impressed with him, but when he actually came to see me, just before he came, he just showed me, you know, lift up his trousers, open up his shirt. The rash had gone. It was only a little band around his ankles. That was the only thing which was left. He said, it's a miracle. Thank you so much. You don't know how much pain I've got rid of. This is tiny, this little rash. Now I can actually live just because of meditation. Well, you know, memories like that just give me so much happiness. Yeah, it does cure disease, but do a soft, kind meditation. Don't do the hard ones. The hard ones make you more sick. <laughs> Nate from Florida. If you pursue a spiritual path, should you stick with one authentic religion or it's okay to take an eclectic approach? Follow the religion of the heart. So here the scriptures are written inside here. And you will be able to, if it's a Christian church next door, or a Muslim church, a mosque next door, or a Jewish or a Buddhist, you will know it feels right. This is beautiful, this is peaceful, this is calm, this creates harmony in this world, takes away the violence, takes away the fault fighting, and takes away all the, the mental problems which comes with such criticism and negativity. If that's the religion which you're hearing, then that is the correct religion. By eclectic, I don't really care whether you call it Theravada Buddhism, Thai Buddhism, Sri Lankan Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Sufi Islam, Salafists. I don't care what you call it. It's just whether it works. In other words, whether it really creates peace inside the heart. Non-violence, harmony between people. Peace, love, kindness. What Abbot Placid said was God. Not a being up in the sky, you know, punishing people, but something which is, you know, is really more important. Peace in the heart, the kindness, the joy, what you really feel, that this is true, this is real, this is something I really want to get into. And that's the sort of path you should take. So really, it's not eclectic, it's one authentic path. It may have many different manifestations, but you know that this is the same path. 
And Mido from Scotland, we only have New Kadampa tradition here in Scotland. She want to attend the sessions. If you feel happiness, if it creates peace inside your heart, fine. But these days, it doesn't matter where you live in the world. You can get the BSWA website, podcasts, broadcasts, or broadcasts through the whole world. So, and many other people do the same as well. So you're very fortunate. In this world, you don't have to follow your local temple. You have the internet instead. And the internet becomes your local temple. Click on every Friday evening at 8 p.m. <laughs> Anywhere in the world. Even to Mars. I'm sure there's many, many aliens also listening to these talks. <laughs> You're most welcome to become members. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, whichever Serve the wine, you know. So the rabbi was fished. He had a uh, double serve, you know. Of course, yeah. usual. <laughs> yeah. Then, then it got to the um, woman candidate, and he put his hand over the glass. He said, "No." He said, "I'd sooner let um, commit adultery than let alcohol touch my lips." <laughs> so, so the Catholic priest saw this. So he poured the wine back into the bottle. And said, "Hell, I didn't know he had a choice." <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice joke. A golden oldie. It's not, I'm not the only one who said, tells bad jokes. <laughs> so thank you for making me feel good. <laughs> so if you didn't get that, they're, they're having this wine and they, they, or this beer, whatever it was, and one of the, the religious people said, no, I can't drink. You know, it's against my precepts. And I'd rather, rather commit adultery than drink alcohol. And the other priest said, I didn't realise we had a choice. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a very good joke. But anyway, thank you so much for that. Okay, so I think we can finish off tonight. Is there any more? No, we did the announcements before. I just to let you know that our WASAC celebration is in two weeks' time on Sunday the 6th. That's the biggest day in the Buddhist year where we have uh, all day celebrations. You can find it out on the web or find it out on the, on the, the notice board. Waysack celebration, celebrating the Buddha's birth, enlightenment, pine and passing away. Lots of things happening on two weeks' time on May the 6th. 6th of May. Very good. So let's pay respects to Buddha Dhamma Sangha now. Sorry? Yes, it's a Sutta class on Sunday, number 75, a golden oldie Magandia Sutta, number 75. That's not the lottery number for this week. <laughs> that is the Sutta on Sunday. Avahan Sama Sambodo Bhagawa Bodang Bhagawandang Abhiwadeimi 
Sawakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasam Supati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sankang Namami Ooh, very good. 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 